Good afternoon um, to all in the room. Thank you for making time to be here. I'm looking forward to having a dialogue and a conversation with you. Let me greet Madam MC. Thank you for the welcome. Thank you for the colleagues who have joined from the academia and the administration, as well as the students, and to my own team who have made time to be here. There are some other colleagues in here that I hope that you will have the chance to meet. Our regional director is here. Our head of our multi-country office is here, and many other colleagues. And one of the first messages I would like to bring and greet you with is that the UN remains a place for diversity and ethics. So when you look at our team and you see us here, know that we represent the opportunity to come with different backgrounds, different thoughts, different ideas. But with that ethical compass you spoke about, Dean, that we're here to make the world better to transform, to support making our lives of global citizens better with systems, with development. And I'm excited to be here because you're my people. I have an MBA in business administration. I am passionate about change and transformation. So I hope you will challenge me in some of those areas. So my name is Sonja, and that's what you can call me. I currently work for the UN Office of Project Services, which is UNOPS. And to start a nice conversation in Africa, we have to start with a little about me, okay? So, this is a baby Sonja. <laughs> this is three years old, so you can then do the math and see I'm a child of the 60s, so that's the area. But it's important as you are on your leadership journey to not forget where you're coming from, and that's why I shared the photo, because we all are on a journey and you don't get there immediately, and you have to remember where you came from. And these are about my values. So this is my family. You will have yours. I am Jamaican. I'm a child of the Caribbean. I'm one of three children. I hold two passports. My husband is from Cote d'Ivoire. I have two children. I still enjoy music and laughter. You don't have to be serious to be in the business world and forget how to smile. Second message for you to remember. And my callings are about change in the humanitarian space. And I have a curiosity about the globe. And if you are considering international careers, you also have to think about what your calling is and what makes you tick. I am also grounded in academia. My confidence comes from the fact that I have the rigor and I have built the time to know my science. I consider myself a management scientist, okay? And I believe in that and I'm very proud of the institutions that contributed to where I am today. So the University of the West Indies, the West Indies where Jamaica is, is very small. So we share a university among the Caribbean states, one of the campuses in Jamaica. And then later in life, I did my MBA at Fordham in New York. So that's a bit about my credentials. I am thinking about a PhD. Stay tuned for that conversation. <laughs> so how did I get here? Um, I thought it would be interesting to tell you. So I showed you baby Sonja, but then I pick up at 1990 when I got my bachelor's degree in management scientist and I left Jamaica. Okay, because that's a very integral part of where it starts for me. And I moved from there and I became an immigrant in the United States. That's another story for another day. But training countries, becoming an immigrant is another situation. But I spent years there. I acquired citizenship. But big things for me was I got my MBA in 1996, paid for by myself working in the day, going to school at night, the American way, okay? 
I'm not going to pay for my children's masters. I have already declared. You, you feel better when you earn it yourself. And then my first international experience was in Bosnia and Herzegovina right after the war. And that's where I got the international book. Because before that, the, the 1990 to 1996, I was a hardcore accountant. Okay, I was an accountant. Um, payroll accountant, general accounting, accounting, okay? And then I moved from that into audit and management audit, and that got me into Bosnia to look at programs and projects that were being implemented and to see if the rules were being applied. Uh, that's where I began to understand that we have the same values. We can't let labels of religion or ethnicity shoulder who we are. We have the same values as a global organism, globals, and that got me this. I then joined the UN with the World Food Program in 1999 in Afghanistan. Okay. And then I moved to Myanmar, which some of you may know as Burma. If you're a nice colonial student, we called it Burma in those days. Then I was part of the creation of a new state, South Sudan, a very exciting part of the journey. I was there. I moved to Ethiopia, which is perhaps one of the strongest federal systems that we have in Africa with decentralization. And from there, I went to the Middle East in Jordan. From there to Switzerland, where I then started to fundraise to create money, to build partnerships, to speak to business leaders about why they should invest in the UN, why we should be a partner to reassure them that we are credible. Because there is a season now where people are judging whether the UN is still credible or are we getting away with things. So that was part of that journey. I then returned to Kenya, where I just left in October where I had the privilege of being with UNEP, that's what you were speaking about in my bio, which is around environmental issues, um, the triple planetary crisis, have you heard of it? Climate, biodiversity loss, and pollution. What we need to do as global citizens, Kenya is doing fabulous work in leading the Africa Climate Summit, was hosted here. Um, it's a leadership in how we use plastics, what we're doing with renewable energy. All of that is things I had to learn, so that wasn't really about my my management expertise, I had to go and learn a whole new business. So it's like if you were in the manufacturing sector doing, I don't know, cement and steel, and then they send you to do cosmetics or pharmaceuticals. You have to learn the business in order to be able to advise, so that has been part of my journey. And then in October, I packed up my bags and I went to Denmark. And this is where I'm currently um, supporting an organization that does practical solutions, operational, and that's what I'm excited to talk to you about here. But as you can see, it's quite a journey. Okay, one of the messages perhaps as you consider careers, should you consider them in the international space, is you kind of have to be courageous, you kind of have to be ready to move out of your comfort zone, you have to be open to listening and experiencing different cultures. Respect for diversity is very important, but you also have to remember who you are and where you come from and what you bring to the table. So that's a little bit about me. And then I didn't just fly to Nairobi to come and speak to you guys with all due respect. Huh? This is an added bonus for me. I am here because of the UN Environmental Assembly, which is taking place every two years, where all global leaders come to decide on environmental decisions for our planet. All countries are represented, and they come. And that was me just yesterday, hot off the press. Um, giving a speech, a TED talk, 
on what it is, what is the one thing that the world needs to do in order to have environmental sustainability. And I spoke to infrastructure. Can you imagine me, a former accountant, speaking to infrastructure and decarbonization and carbon emissions? But yes, you can learn and you can adapt. And if you believe in the issues, you can speak to it. And when you have colleagues who support you, you're able to do it. And I thought to also show you that I had the honor of being with your first lady yesterday for two sessions, one a luncheon, and then she delivered a high-level um, speech yesterday about her initiative on planting 500 million trees in 2030. She talked about renewable energy, the planet, and Kenya's role leading for the, for the continent, as you were talking about leading on the continent. She also spoke of it. And I thought I'd share that picture with you because there is also something very interesting about that and about the business world and what we're doing. There is a woman there from Jamaica. There's a woman there from Denmark. There's a woman there from Kenya. And there's a woman there from Morocco. There was also a woman there from Tanzania, but she's not in that picture. Five women on that stage, okay? The one on the left in blue is the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Trade. She's in our business, okay? The one in the middle is the First Lady. She is known for her woman empowerment and her business dealings there. Inger Anderson is a leading environmentalist and the head of the United Nations Environment Program, okay? So she heads that UNEA that is going on now. And there you have me, okay? So there are messages about things are happening, things are transforming. And you know, you should take pride that your country is a part of it. And think of the opportunities you may have to be in a picture like this in a few years' time. It happens very quickly, guys. So a little bit about UNOPS and the UN system. First, I have to tell you about the UN system because I want you to understand a bit about what the institution is around. So the UN, the United Nations, is founded 1945, headquartered in New York. We have values that are enshrined in a UN charter which guide us. We are com it's a universal body comprised of 193 member states. And the Secretary General is Antonio Guterres, who I hope you have had the privilege to see speak. He's courageous and passionate about the moral compass the world is on. We have a number of agencies, and we have 38,000 people across the globe working for us. And then I and my team are one of the subsidiary agencies called UNOPS. We are located in Copenhagen, Denmark, and it's the only UN organization with a headquarters based in Nordic countries. You won't be able to read this slide, but you will be able to get it. But the UN is a complex system, it is very true. It's not easy to do so because it came out of the Second World War. That's how it was started. It has its own way of working. The Security Council, I'm sure you've heard of. The General Assemblies, where governments are. And we have a number of things around justice and other entities of which UNOPS is there. So that's if you ever want to know how to navigate the system, this is where that information is. UNOPS is an operational arm of our UN, and we support the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals through implementation of projects. So many UN agencies, will, you will hear them saying, we no longer do projects. We are just trying to help people to build systems or develop policies. That's not true for us. We still go into very rural, very difficult areas, get our hands dirty, and make things happen. So that's who we are. 
And I want to just read the second part, which is that we are in the solution space. Look at that second paragraph. By demonstrating how solutions can be delivered on the ground, UNOPS makes a meaningful contribution, bringing innovation to bear as we strive to build a better future for all. So that's what we are doing. We are in the solution space, very pragmatic. And now we come to what do we do exactly? Infrastructure, what's infrastructure? I'm gonna show you a picture so I'll demystify. Procurement, project management, financial management, human resources. You see why it's important to come to a business school. You notice I didn't tell you about political affairs and international relations and what have you. I'm speaking to a different skill set and saying this is also welcome in the UN. So we do a lot of work in services, etc., based on these skills. And these are some of the projects that we're very proud of. We help, we build bridges, we provide access to drinking water, we build health care clinics, improve systems, um, we do grids, we rebuild public infrastructure. These are the areas that we work in to give you some idea. And that means that we are looking for many different types of skills, which is what I'll go to now. So UNOPS, as part of that 38,000 people I told you are in the UN, 5,200 work with UNOPS across 100 locations. And you can see how the biggest part of our labor force is between 30 and 39. Okay, and the smallest is over 60, okay? I'm in the one above it, the 50 to 59 group, also in the minority, okay? Uh, maybe that's because the operational wing is very strong, so it's where you can build careers. But this is how we are, and by gender, um, we are what well, we consider that parity, yeah? We're almost 50-50 on gender. In Africa, we are 900 people working in 30 plus countries. And here you see the 30s and 40s are almost neck and neck, followed by the rest. So this gives you an idea of what, who is looking to work with us and who we need to work with. We believe and we talk about values and ethics. So let me tell you a bit about our values. So should you consider a career in the UN, there are certain values that we hold. Respect for gender parity, geographic parity, meaning that we must represent who we serve, which means that we must be from all over the globe. We believe in inclusion, people with disabilities, gender identities we include, and also underrepresented groups. So we are about inclusion, okay? So that is something that we non-compromising on. Who are we looking for? Well, we're looking for IT, engineering, project and program management, communication partnership, leadership, support services. So in every, in every given year, we advertise about a thousand job opportunities and a hundred internships. They vary, they could be three months, six months, one year, they vary, okay? But they are opportunities um, and that is something we, we are very proud of as well. Um, we have internship programs and unlike the rest of the UN, we are all able to offer very small stipends, okay? Um, and so these are the areas, the top five internship categories we have. Again, project management is there, communications, partnerships, HR, and IT, right? What do you need to be qualified? Well, you need to be enrolled in an undergraduate or graduate university degree program or to have completed your degree within the past three years. And this is how you apply. We have a website. You have to do a bit of homework. Don't apply if you don't meet the requirements. The system will just shoot 
you out, okay? Make sure that you look at that and then prepare. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Prepare the application, it does pay off. I know there is a common saying that you can't get into the UN and everybody's already inside. We were all external. We were all external at one point. This is not a father and mother business situation. Yeah? So we were all eternal. But it is highly competitive, it's true. So that's a recruitment process, nothing particularly very exciting or different than what you would have learned as you go through this journey. No secrets here, um, no secrets. Because we have such high volumes of applicants, normally there are technical assessments, okay? Because it's a way of being objective and fair, blind marked, blind scored, so that's what it's really for. And then we do interviews where we seek to understand the experiences you have and how they apply for the kinds of jobs that you're going to do. That's what's called a competency-based interview. So, I made it very short because I wanted you to be able to engage with me and my colleagues on any questions you may have. So, thank you. So, good afternoon. Um, my name is Horacio. So, um, I got two questions, but uh, the first one is going to be a little bit longer, so I'll start with the second one. So um, as you've shown us, you do some, um, I would say, um, quite vast work, like building a bridge is not something that is done in one day and takes a lot of resources. And um, when you regard it as money or um, labor work. So, and you see, these are infrastructures really what that will help like the actual gov like country you're working in. So um, as I know, UN is a non-governmental um, organization. But my question is, do you work with the actual government or countries you work in? Because these are things which require a lot of work and a lot of organization. So that's my first question. My second one, um, it's more regarding on your personal journey, in a way. Because you see, you moved from being an accountant to now you being a director and a secretary of the UN. And uh, that's, as you can, you said also, it's quite not really comprehensive. So you see, it's a really long journey, turned out to be quite different from what you expected, I believe. So how was it personally, um, and as you say, a lot of people, what we hear, personally, I, um, that uh, it's hard to get to the UN, that maybe connections, and you can't just get it like that. So I'd like to hear more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Horatio, you said your name. Yes, okay. So, um, we, so UNOPS works with governments, okay, with other UN agencies, with international financial institutions like the Africa Development Bank or the Islamic Bank or the World Bank, okay? And also with philanthropic institutions. So we work with a lot of partners. We are a part of the UN, so whatever work we're doing has to align with government national priorities, okay? So there is a system where the governments decide, normally around every five years, what the priorities they want to have in order to meet this the SDGs, right? So they have to decide, does my population, is it about hunger and food? Is it about poverty alleviation? Is it about infrastructure? Most times it's about all of them, okay? But they have to prioritize. And then UNOPS will go in to say, we can help you to do so. So it depends on the country. In some countries, yes, we work on behalf of governments, okay? Such as the Ministry of Health to build health clinics or to help to bring vaccination cold chain. It could be that. Or it could be Ministry of Industry and Trade, okay? It could be about road networks. 
It could be Ministry of Immigration. It could be about immigration services building and immigration thing. We have done some fabulous work in Somalia around those areas. So that is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is that we have sister UN agencies that may have the ideas and the technical expertise, but don't have staff in the various countries that they're working. And so we provide the staff to go and do the projects to ensure that you can make the case that it's not just all theory, that it actually translates into something on the ground for someone Largely, we go to rural villages, yeah? We work in difficult, so UNOPS is a little unique. We work in difficult situations a lot of the time. We're not in glamorous places, okay? And that's because that's often the people being left behind. And part of the UN journey is to leave no one behind, okay? So we provide that capacity to do that. So that's question number one. Question two, which was question one? Okay, and then question one, which was then what you asked as question two, is how did I get here and what did I do? Did I understand the question right? Okay, so the fun fact is I was going to be a fashion designer when I left school. Mm. Yeah, that's the fun fact. Okay, I was a creative. I danced, I did fashion shows, I modeled, um, I did weddings. I was a wedding planner because I was an entrepreneurial spirit and to get money from my father, I had to make business cases for him to invest because he was a banker for me to get money. So that's where I started, okay? And I also defied my mother, who wanted me to be a lawyer. And I thought all lawyers went to court to try criminals, and I couldn't see myself doing that. And so two things that all parents need to learn is that children can be a little crazy at some point. So that was where I was heading to. Things happened. A recession happened in the US and the BIOS program I was part of got suspended and I needed to eat, okay? So I had to go with the academic training I had, even though I thought I was more brilliant than accounting, okay? I had to go with that in order to eat, okay? And I never went back the other way. So now when I can wear an orange dress, I say, that goes to the child I was, that I can still do that. So that's putting it in a funny way. But on the other hand, what you will find as you're on your journey is that what you are building as business school graduates is part of a toolkit and it's actually more flexible than you think it is, okay? So you have to embrace every opportunity that comes. Some come with planning, some come by accident, okay? And make the most. What will be important in that is what did you learn and how did you show up? Did you give it your all? Were you professional? Will people want to work with you again? That is what, at the end of the day, is going to make it, and you will navigate different environments, different industries, different things. So I did accounting. I was very proud, okay, to be an accountant, but then it got boring, okay? It got boring, right? I did a bit of auditing. Felt I had some power, you know, people are afraid of auditors. Okay, so it gave me a bit of a power move. But I then became frustrated because you're always looking at things after the fact. It's already happened if you're going to audit. You can't influence that much actually, right? And I told you I was driven by solutions, yeah, by change. So I moved to the service side of it, the operational side. I had the finance, I had to learn the accounts, the HR, okay? I have always supervised colleagues who do IT. I am terrible 
a technology, but I do, because I learned that a team has diversity in skills, and if you learn how to ask the right question, you can navigate, and you shouldn't leave your colleagues behind. You have to share, right? And you have to create opportunities. So by navigating, uh, to being courageous and being open, you know, when I went to Bosnia, I think I was the first black person. Let's not talk about Caribbean, African thing. I think I was the first black person to show up, okay? In many, many years. And I used to stop traffic when I walked on the road, literally. The country was after war, okay? They didn't have a whole lot going on. So when I showed up, everybody stopped. I was in my 20s, I didn't care. I thought it was funny, right? But for other people, depending on your mindset, that can make you afraid because you are different. And do you know who you are and can you embrace it? So the converse, but, and then after the curiosity and perhaps a bit of discrimination, I showed up. I did my job. I worked hard, okay? Now, a secret about the UN to get to your other part is that you have to pay your dues. And people don't like to talk about it. What do I mean? It seems like a cushy place to work but you got to work long hours. Ask any of my young colleagues here. It's not a nine to fiver, okay? Because the people that we serve don't have problems. Earthquakes don't happen between nine and five. Floods don't happen between nine and five. Women wars don't happen normally between nine and five, okay? So if you're in this business, Okay, you have to be able to commit to working really long hours. And that's not everybody's cup of tea. And it doesn't have to be. So in my younger days, I worked some 16 hour days. I lived in tents. I lived in containers. I did the work. And in that work, I learned a lot, which now, when I'm in a position of decision-making and authority, allows me to go back to that person and think of what I encountered in that and do it. So that is about navigation. So that's the second. The third is that you have to have pride in what you bring to the table. So for years, when I looked at leaders, and we all look at leaders, I don't know who you are, you want to be like them, right? And not many leaders are sexy accountants, let's be honest. It's not really where you see them, right? You see them on the stage, international relations, lawyers, they're doing all kinds of glamorous things. And so I did think about, do I change? careers? Do I change if I want the limelight? But at some point I realized I've invested in this career and I've invested in these skills. So I will change industries. I will change the type of agency. Because this has gone. Yes. To get to, I will change the type of agency I So I have another one from our, our registration, our online uh, team. So the question was, how can organizations leaders maintain global standards in leadership without leaving anyone behind? This is from Angela Asio. Hi, Angela. Wow, that's a very important question. It's something that we were just talking with the dean about, and it's something that we, in fact, this morning I was meeting with the director general, and we were talking about the moral compass of the world and whether that is lost or it's dying, because it seems like many people that we have elected into positions of authority or who run businesses have become a bit bold in not following standards. 
yes, in not conforming to systems. So I hear you, and it's a conundrum, and I'm not sure I have all the answers, okay? But I do believe that you need to be built on a firm foundation as a leader. There a rising, a shooting star dies out, okay? Leaders have to be in it for the long run. And they have to be built on spending the time. That does not mean that leadership means you are 60 and you are not 20. That's not what it means. But it means that you have to invest in building credibility, building trust, having an area of expertise, okay? So that's one component of it. The second component is global standards were indeed meant to make a level playing field for all of us. You have integrity standards, corruption indexes, you have SDGs. These are all standards, okay, that we have. They are good, but to be honest, we need to also pay attention to who made the standards and what's behind the standards. Because now we're in a special place in humanity where all standards can't be made in the developed world at the expense of the developing world. Okay, and this is now part of the conversation, right? So standards also need to reflect a bit of the context and a global leader has to understand that. So there is no need for me to come to Jamaica, okay? and apply standards that have no relevance to Jamaica, but are standards, okay? It doesn't work, okay? Because now we have to talk about motivation. Is that actually trade and economic interest, or is that standards? And those are questions you will have to navigate as leaders. What is it about and what's driving it? But standards we need, regional standards we need, national standards we need, global standards we need. But it's about navigating and as a leader having the curiosity to remember what's my problem statement? What is it I'm trying to fix by applying these standards? My name is Jacqueline Gure. I work here at SBS as a project manager. Society has given women such a big role in terms of how you take care of your family, your home and all that. I noticed you have been into like about 10 or more countries working. How did you manage that as a way of trying to empower as women who may be shying away from taking opportunities because of that part? How did you go about it? Thank you very much. It's true. It's not easy to navigate and it has trade-offs. So let me say it up front, right? Um, in my own personal journey, well, to be honest, I had children much later in life than other women would generally have, which did allow me to make some bold decisions earlier on. Uh, so that's true. Okay, but my story is not the only story and there are other women who have done it differently. You know, my mother taught me to my own, to thine own self be true, okay? And life is about trade-offs. I do not agree to the social media myth that you can have it all, okay? And this is a problem that we have currently. You don't have it all. You may have it at different times in your life, at different parts on the journey. But it's important to have it all. So yes, as a woman, I'm not a big fan of the Barbie movie that was out a couple of months ago. I'm not, but there was, my daughter was super excited at it. She's 17, so I went. And there is a, a part, a soliloquy where they talk about a woman, a woman having to be this, she can't be too 
good looking, she can't be too ugly, she can't be fat, she can't be small, she can't be this, she can't be that, right? I've also been, there is the home care role, there is the role of devoted wife, there is the role of devoted child, there is the role of personally community leader, right? In addition to your personal goals, okay? Some will be more prominent at some points in your life and others less prominent. But if you're looking at it as a journey and you know what you want, you will probably navigate the different seasons, right? So that's what I would say in general. So not, ju not dodge the question for me. I did it by spending money. So in order to move, I had to have a home base which was secure. My mother is my secret weapon, but it comes with a cost. Lots of airfares, lots of bribing and buying gifts, lots of managing family commitments and being the one who always puts out so that my mother is released or she was released when I was young to be able to stay when I was moving. So that was money. The second decision, I was able to convince my husband for four years to not work when I had one of those regional jobs. I hated it because I didn't like being the sole income earner. I didn't like that stress, but then I reminded myself, men do it all the time, so you can do it, okay? Right? So I did it, okay? But it also meant that we as a couple, and we celebrated 20 years in December, we have made, we have made choices, okay? His career is not as far developed as my career is, okay? And I also have to be able to shift roles. So I may be head honcho in the office, but I'm not head honcho. <laughs> Okay? And I have to be comfortable navigating that space. So I'm speaking to you honestly. So that's how, that's how it was done. Okay? So I don't own five million properties because I had to invest in other things because when I got the children late, then I decided that became priority. And by then I was in my 30s. I wasn't in my 20s. So I had a little autonomy to be able, I had a little courage to tell my boss, you know I need to go to the doctor with my child. Because when you're in your 20s, you are scared to say those things, okay? So, yeah, I had that courage and now, you know, priority one is kids. I don't outsource doctor's appointments and I don't outsource educational issues. Everything else can be outsourced. Drivers, taxis, everything else can be outsourced, but you need to do that. Each one of us have to make that choice for us, okay? And then we see. But it is possible, but not everything at the same time. I don't know, Dalila, would you agree? 100%. Uh, 100, uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Francis, a business student here. Um, I have three questions. The first one was, as the Deputy Executive Director of UNOPS, what is your approach to project management since you've just been maybe shifted to that sector? Secondly, um, you talked about your love for entrepreneurship. So how have you been able to encompass this in your in the different UN offices you've worked in? And lastly, does UN take into account um, innovation and creativity or does it innovation and creativity or does it encourage it? If so, how? Excellent questions, Francis. So, I am not a Prince II certified expert, if this is what we mean by project management. So let me put my disclaimer in, in, in the room. So I don't have that expertise. It's areas that I am going to learn. 
but I am happy to be part of an army of 5,000 that has the expertise. Okay, so my job is more to find solutions when they meet bottlenecks than to do design and check. But I do know, um, because of the years in the system, the importance of the planning component of project design. I know the very important part of the milestones. Yeah, um, the checking to see if it's on track or not. Scoping is very important. So if you mean that, I know the basics, but I'm not going to tell you I'm certified. And if I was doing the project management, then a whole lot of people should be worried because that means other people are not doing their jobs. But um, what we are doing and what I'm doing in my position as a deputy is making sure do my colleagues who have those roles feel that they are fit for purpose? Can they deliver? with the systems that we have in place? Do they have the resources? Or is there a problem that I need to fix? So that is how I approach it based on my role, okay? And I trust them to be in the front to actually negotiate and deliver, right? So in this role, I play a back seat, right? So that's number one. Number two was, you tell you I have Alzheimer's. Oh. Well, when you were talking, the first thing I was thinking is uh, some of my entrepreneurial skills died when I joined the UN because we take an oath of office and a standard of conduct and one of the things is that you have only one boss in life and that is the UN. You cannot do secondary jobs, we don't outsource, we have to keep our allegiance and our alignment to the UN. So even though I dreamed, I've dreamt of all kinds of things, transportation, business, hardware, equipment, taxes, you name it, I haven't pursued any of those. I have financed for family members, so I do get into the conversation of business planning, but that. But my entrepreneurial skills are about creating opportunities where there are none. So that's how I bring it to the table. So I look at who we work with, what can be done, who can I connect with. So the connecting part of entrepreneurialism is still very alive and well in me, the networks. And the business part of is there a business case and does it make financial sense for sustainability are there. And I also actually enjoy risk taking. So I have some of those entrepreneurial skills still applying in the work that I do. So it hasn't been lost. Okay? And I'm preparing for retirement and I think I'm going to go back. But stay tuned for that. It's, it's at odds with the PhD, so we don't know which one will show up, but it's there. And then the final component which you were asking about, the space of innovation. I think 10 years ago I would have said no, there is no space for innovation in the UN. Um, we had a hard time keeping young talent because we, other words you would hear, Horatia talked about it being hard to get in. Another word is when you're in, you're so straight jacketed. There are so many rules, there are so many things to conform to that it becomes boring. You feel these skills. So I would have said 10 years ago, maybe I didn't see so much in the innovation space. That has changed because business requires us to innovate. To remain competitive, to deliver innovation is important. Innovation in what we cost, innovation in the solutions we take to communities, it is all changing. Also, the IT space is a space, if we want to go to what people normally think about, which is IT, when they think of innovation, we have to embrace our artificial intelligence. We have to look at even areas like gaming and those areas because that's what matters to the populations we serve now. So we have to use those vehicles to get our messages across and to find solutions. So right now, it's a very good time for innovation in the UN. Yeah, It's coming out again. Yes. 
the question, uh, and thank you very much for that uh, very nice presentation. Um, we have uh, I've observed, at least with many of our young graduates, they get into organizations as they rise in the organization. One of the things they, com they talk about is the organizational politics and the challenge sometimes of navigating organization politics. And this may become more relevant or intense the higher you get in the organization. Uh, perhaps I, I would like you to give us uh, some insights on how to manage this aspect of organizational life uh, and your own experiences there and how you've managed to navigate because you've risen to very high levels in the UN. <laughs> So you're asking me if I'm a politician. <laughs> <laughs> to a certain extent, yes. Um, I think in any group system that you're in, whether you are in a family setting or a clan, whether you are in a community setting or what have you, you have to navigate managing people and different perspectives if you're to lead. So I'm going to simplify it for you. It exists. Politics is alive and well in every social organism strata that we have, right? You know who are the influencers in your family circles. You know who are the influencers in your... You know them, okay? And yes, you do have to navigate them. And chances are you have to learn, you have to make some mistakes, I'm going to be honest, before you get it right. I don't think many of us are born with perfect political maneuvering skills. So what have I done, which is your question? I tend to listen and observe a lot before I speak. I'm speaking to people who are meeting me now, so I am, I am wondering what they think. But I tend to listen and observe quite a little. A Jamaican saying is that you don't eat rice when it's hot, okay? So I never speak in anger, a big political lesson, okay? Even when people are irritating the heck out of me, it's okay if you think I am weak, that's why I haven't answered you. I will process and come back, okay? That's a very important lesson. Self-control, self-management, self-navigation is really important in the political scale. Another tip in this case is don't make it about you and the issue at the beginning. Make it about the other person. So connection is very important. It's much easier, why do you want politics? You want politics because you want to negotiate, you want something, right? You're trying to maneuver, that's why you want it. So that is best delivered when someone feels you respect and connect with them before you start pushing your agenda. That's why politicians go on rallies and campaigns, they wanna get out there and connect. It takes place, in settings as well, you have to have the connection. So those are three components that we all need to have, but my fourth is that uh, I, believe, I believe that what I say should be my bond. I'm still very old fashioned in that thing. So if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And if I say I can't do it, and I can't do it, okay? Because I believe that you will need me in the good times and the bad times, and I will need you. So I tend to make alliances with those who I feel share my values. It does not mean that I can't work and respect those who have different values. It doesn't mean that. But it means I have to be really clear about what my moral compass is before I enter into any conversation. So that is what I would say. It helps that I love to talk too. Greetings, um, protocol observed. I'm honored to hear from you, Sonja. And um, I have two questions. <clears throat> My name is Makanga Kevin, and uh, I'm in charge of public policy at Strathmore Business School. 
my first question is what is the equivalent of UN OPS for the African Union? Because uh, you have a whole global network that I believe is very essential for the African continent. And um, I will be excited to, to see that, uh, considering I know the African Union works with portfolios. So it has economic affairs, human resources, and that kind of a thing. So I would really want to know the equivalent for the African Union. Now, question number two. As you said, standards are being made all over the world differently with their different vested interests. Now, the African Union has um, Agenda 2063, the one that sees um, to implement, uh, to catalyze African social economic activities for the next 50 years across different generations. So my question is, in your line of work, um, as someone overseeing the implementation of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, how do you help the African Union in implementing the AU Agenda 2063, considering that Agenda 2063 is similar to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, but selfish for Africa. So we're asking, um, why can't we have uh, fast trains like Japan? Why can't we have modern cities? We are trying to build Konza and Tatu. Uh, why can't we have an African university for all of us? Like, So we are all in the battle uh, against poverty, eradication of disease, and that kind of a thing. But I think you at the UN, you are miles ahead. And we are looking at you to aid Africa to implement its AU Agenda 2063. Thank you. much and I'm glad that you feel that the UN has a role to play in this journey. We feel that we have a role but it's good to know that you do as well. Your question has a depth and diversity to it that could be an hour long because some of it is quite controversial actually and some of it links to geopolitical and regional debates. And as a good diplomat, I'm going to navigate some of that, okay? But to the first question, what is UNOPS to the African Union? We are simply a partner. We don't have an arm that would be directly comparable because we are there to support the African Union in its drive to get change and transformation across the Africa. Their agenda is our agenda because their agenda is also in the sustainable development goals. As you said, the African Union is built across themes, right? Health theme, education, economic, etc. We are operational and implementation. So should you decide that you want to work in the justice field, or what have you, then we will help in that area. Should you decide that you want social services, more maternal health, um, midwifery, etc., we can work in that area. Should it be about accessibility to water, we can work in that area. So we are not contained to what, what we wish to be is a premier partner of choice bringing solutions. And that's what the second part is. One of our biggest value adds why governments choose to work with us and we offer services is because we're global and we have knowledge of what works in different settings and what are low cost options, medium cost options, and high cost options, okay? So we bring knowledge, yeah, practical knowledge to help governments through their engagement with the African Union, both in what they call upstream, which is the planning area, right? But all the way downstream to where the actual deliverable of that concrete thing is. We do it all, okay? So that's one element that I want to say is how we play. 
I too am excited as a daughter of the diaspora and an in-law that there is an agenda for the African continent rooted in the SDGs but going beyond, right? And I wish when I heard 2063, to be honest, I wish it was a little earlier than 2063. As you said here again, I thought that's in 40 years, 50 thing, likely not to be in my lifetime, okay? But I do understand the vision of the 40 years, given that Africa is the content with the youngest population on the planet, okay? And therefore, that is actually visionary to build the giant that we plan to be 40 years from now. We're not exactly a mouse, but it speaks to an investment and a vision of where we're going. And actually, as I thought about it, it's a realism that we need to have because it says our leaders are going to try to be less selfish and think of the immediate strategies that will give them votes and think about strategies that will allow their grandchildren and great-grandchildren to, fl to, to flourish, okay? So I turned it around after I looked at it originally, okay? I'm talking now as a global citizen, right? And thought about what does it mean. And ladies and gentlemen of the room, all protocols observed indeed, Africa is sitting on incredible opportunity, okay? Um, natural resources, intellectual resources, working capital, it's all here, okay? We have, however, been a bit sidetracked by getting into things of boundaries of geographical lines, of sovereignty issues, now we seem to be entering into a very uncomfortable phase of who owns what and where do the resources belong and we go to back to colonial lines of what was drawn and whether that was right. They are distractions. They are distractions for us all pulling together to bring each other up because at the end of the day, Africa will be as strong as the weakest in Africa. Okay. So I trust that the African Union, okay, will also, along with the UN, build a credibility and a citizenry that will believe and get us further. Which is why I was excited when I heard of the increase in countries in the continent that are doing away with visa restrictions in the continent. It sounds small or it sounds like a political campaign, but it's so huge, okay, to understand what free move is. Do you know what free movement does when it comes to trade? Moving skills, building skills, transferring to knowledge. It is an incredible, an incredible choice. So I look forward to more of those coming on board. Uh, we also need to get the right balance between international service and national service, okay? How do I support Jamaica when I have moved out and I have become an international civil servant? Where is my space to give back to Jamaica as a citizen of Jamaica in its development? Where as I chart that? It's something that individually I have to maintain, and I do it in many ways. There is the direct support, the direct connection, but there is also the realism, and I'm going back to the standards conversations, you know, one of the importance of having diversity in the room is that when a problem is presented, different solutions can be offered, okay? And different solutions, not meaning that one is right and one is wrong, but just that different perspectives and different contexts bring different things, okay? We need to do more of that, and that's where I am in the standard space, is that differentiation but standard space. So that's what I'm looking at. I think I should ask Dalila if she would like to contribute to this. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Like the practical terms, because I'm an engineer, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's why we complement each other so well. So your question is really very interesting, interesting regarding how can we, UNOPS and the UN, contribute to the 2063 agenda on practical terms, just for you to be aware of what is going on. The last year I was part of a working group in which um, we were at the UN level discussing how can we, UN uh, level, and specifically at the UNOPS, contribute to the main priorities of the 2063 agenda. And we end up concluding that 70% of the SDGs and 70% and, and, and of the main uh, priorities of the African Union are common. So I'm, I was really super pleased to, 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 to be part of this working group in which we have now, you know, uh, agreed and discussed and agreed on how we'll be working together and, you know, in order to ensure that we move in the same direction and we make really a big impact in Africa. Of course, we really want to achieve SDGs in Africa, but of course we also know that we are in some countries we are really far away from where we should be. So the more we contribute to the SDGs and the more we contribute to the 2063 agenda, really the more we'll allow you, uh, we as, a, as an all that's so the ones that live in Africa to achieve uh, the requirements and the, uh, the, our, our targets. So it is like the practical term of this Africa Union and UN uh, contribution and how we are uh, working together and partnering to the same objectives. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm here. Ah, okay. <laughs> so Anthony is my name. I'm working in the business school. Um, I want to touch on the thorny issue of um, big institutions and the blips that come with administrative um, mistakes or errors. And I imagine you came into UNOPS in one of those moments when there was a blip of an error. Uh, I don't know whether you want to speak around this and, and, and what you're doing. Great. That means you did your homework. So actually, my last two jobs have been in organizations that have made blips in errors, and I joined in the turnaround part. So I'm getting a bit of a reputation of being part of turnarounds. Both of them, at the, at the end of the day, were bad decisions by leadership. Okay, so if you remember where I started at the beginning where I talked about moral compasses and character, it's real, okay? Because at the end of the day, you are human beings. So in one, it was about blatant disregard of rules on administration, administrative things. Can you imagine losing your job because of not following the rules on travel? It happened. So when they say there is no accountability, it happens, okay? When you treat people bad and they get upset with you, they know how to show people where to find the things are buried, okay? It's the truth. So you ask me to be true, it's one. In the second case, we are still trying to digest what happened, but for sure, factually, we had a leader who made a very, very wrong decision in terms of how to utilize funds that belong to the organization and that create and invested it in something which no project manager would have thought made sense. Okay, It is yet to be seen whether there were personal motivations in it or if it was not. At this stage, it doesn't matter. The judgment was really bad. Okay, And it involved quite a bit of money. Okay, And it has damaged the credibility not only of what we do, but the entire institution. So we take it seriously. So yes, this is true things. Um, I was in a conversation last week with my management team, of which Dalila is a member, and one of our members said, when you deal with bad situations and crisis, okay, there are three A's that you should have. You need to acknowledge that something bad happened, you need to apologize that it happened, take your accountability, and then you need to act to make sure it doesn't happen again. 
Okay? I have joined this journey on the apologizing and acting part. The acknowledging has been done, okay? The fast, quick wins were there. We're now in a very difficult season of transformation because when you're in the management space and you have a failing that looks like a system failing, your natural instinct is to do a risk mapping of where are all the risks and shut them all down. Okay? Create more processes. And this is something you need to learn. Yeah? Create more processes. Create more checklists. Hard code that IT system so people can't break it. Right? That is the natural reaction to risk management. It stabilizes the ship. Okay? It stops the bleeding potentially, okay? But it's not necessarily the same action you need to get back in the game. So the act part starts to be crippled too much if that stopping the bleeding is happening. To be honest, I feel that my organization is a bit in that space. So we're talking about transformation, okay? We're talking about understanding how we work together, what different roles do to contribute, because for sure, one of the outcomes of this is we have more accountability and more need to report to our board, to our governing bodies, who are very upset that this happened under their watch. And so from reporting twice a year to three times, we now report monthly. Do you know what work that takes to report monthly? Okay? But we are in penance. Okay? So you need to build, rebuild credibility. So reporting monthly is what we do. Okay? But then there are other things about what lessons did we learn from that? How did it happen? What could we have done differently? And to be honest, they are less in the system space, which was the initial reaction, and they're more in the organizational culture space. So behaviors, okay? Behaviors of teams, behaviors of leaders, behaviors in how to make decisions is the space that we're beginning to navigate. It's not like the case study that you read. It's very frustrating because you're going fast and you're going slow at different times. Um, but it is the journey. And I'm proud that the bleeding has stopped. We're actually acting on some places, but the other part of the uh, yeah, the apologizing is also still going on. We're still being asked to apologize, hence the monthly briefings. Okay. So before I let you go, I, I've seen from, this is now, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> Madam MC is Juliet Hinga. She works in communication here at the business school. And um, from your PowerPoint, I see that there's, practically gender balance at UNOPS. And so ahead of this year's International Women's Day, so maybe you can share your thoughts on, as, individual, as an individual, what do you do as a leader to inspire inclusion? Make space at the table. Yeah? Make space at the table. Um, and personally, and what do I mean by make space at the table? I don't make judgments about whether or not a woman can be put in a position of leadership because she's in the childbearing age years. I'm going to speak to you really honestly. Okay? That's a big one that I faced in my generation, so I'm putting it on the table. I don't make decisions based on that. I make decisions understanding that, as the colleague in the back raised, we have multiple roles that we play, okay? And in order for you to bring your best self to the professional role, I need to make sure that not just me, because I'm one, hmm? but the policies that we make allow you to have space to honor your other roles. Right now, the UN calls that the future of work. Yeah, What does the workspace look like going forward? That's a big part of it. We have learned that it's very easy to attract women, 
because women are educated nowadays. I don't know what your statistics are, but in many universities, um, the woman enrollment is higher than the male. Okay, so just by fact of intake, it means the outtake will also be high. So you're educated, you come into the workforce, but you can't stay because other pressures go. You don't like those long hours I told you or something else. So one of the things I can do in my position now is I can make policy and shape policy to make this better. I also want to tell you I have a boy child. So gender parity does not mean that I'm making space only for women because that's another crisis coming, okay? That our men will feel that they just sit back and wait on us to work and I'm not into that, okay? So it's about the respect and making it that each one feels that they have a place at the table, but that this, the things are thing for all. So when we do parental leave, parental leave applies to when men and women. We don't, normally, don't talk anymore about maternity leave. We talk about parental leave as an example. Good, thank you so much. A round of applause for Ms. Sandra.